Ladies and, ladies and gentlemen, thank you so much for joining us for this session on safeguarding Syria. My name is Lara Satrakin. I'm the executive editor of News Deeply. This session will no longer be broadcast on Dubai TV, but it will be webcast live on wefforum.org, and you can watch it on demand on the World Economic Forum's website after the session. We come to this panel discussion with a heavy heart and with a heavy sense of humility. The Syrian civil war has taught us our collective limitations. It's taught us the limitations of the global system, its failure to stop Syria's slide toward disintegration, a failure to stop the bloodshed of well over 100,000 people, and a failure to find leadership and consensus enough to take clear, coordinated action on a diplomatic level to solve Syria's crisis. What's unfolded as a result is one of the great human tragedies of our time. It's a humanitarian crisis with the geopolitical consequences that will echo for generations. And those two dimensions, the human suffering and the security catastrophe, those ramifications, are profoundly intertwined. The misery of Syrians cannot be ignored, both for the humane reasons of our own compassion and also for the practical consequences on regional civility. More than 1.5 million refugees have fled Syria. More than 4 million are displaced inside the country. The UN has talked of having to scale back assistance for lack of funding, for pledges of aid unfulfilled. Looking at conditions on the ground, we see epidemic, potentially epidemic levels of disease in Syria come summer. Basic sanitation, clean water has completely broken down in some areas. Syrian doctors tell me they're bracing for cholera. They're already seeing a spike in cases of leishmaniasis, a disease unique to Aleppo province. How will this region cope? How can the international community effectively intervene? What is the right role for players, stakeholders like the US, Russia, and the Arab League? And to paraphrase our program here today, how can stakeholders secure Syria's economic, political, and social viability as a state when the state itself is arguably falling apart. We'll put that to our distinguished panelists today. I'm pleased to be joined by Alex Alenikoff, Deputy High Commissioner, Commissioner for Refugees at UNHCR, Father Paolo Dallolio, a priest with the Syriac Catholic Church. He also goes by Abuna Paolo. He has spent so much of his life in Syria that that's really become his moniker. Sarah Lee Whitson, the Executive Director for the Middle East and North Africa at Human Rights Watch and Salman Sheikh, the director for the Brookings Doha Center in Qatar. Thank you so much for joining us. Let's start with you, Alex. What is the state of play for Syrian refugees? How is this crisis taking a toll on regional players, both inside the camps and out? Yeah, you've uh, painted the, the basic humanitarian crisis here. 1.5 million uh, refugees already who have fled Syria. Our predictions are that if the, if the current rate of departure, and we see no reason why that wouldn't uh, stay where it is, we'll be at 3 million refugees by the, the end of the year. Already in Lebanon and Jordan, more than 450,000 refugees. In Turkey, over 300,000. Iraq, another 154,000. And then about 80,000 in Egypt. And these numbers will continue to rise. What, what, what's important to see in, in the, the crisis, particularly for, for Jordan uh, and for Lebanon, is that uh, most of the refugees are not living in camps. People tend to think refugees flee over borders or put in refugee camps and cared for by the international community. In Lebanon, there are more than 1,000 sites that refugees have settled in all through the country. Same in, in Jordan. There's a, there are camps in Jordan, but it, they only take about 25% of the population. This has led to a tremendous burden on local communities for the refugees themselves to find a place to stay. People are living in really terrible shelter situations but also for the host communities who have been very generous in accepting refugees, first actually taking people into their own homes and then subsequently assisting them. But, but we're, we're reaching points of really difficulties of absorption. There are tens of thousands of more children in local schools. Electricity and water resources are being uh, severely affected. Rents have gone up dramatically. Wages have dram dramatically declined. So the ripple effect of this through the community uh, certainly huge, huge burdens on the refugees themselves, the people who've had to give up everything to flee. But then the ripple effects in, into the host communities has also been dramatic. What does that do to the social fabric in those communities, both the tension between the refugees and the local population, 
<coughs> the refugees themselves with these spikes in domestic violence, signs of strain yeah. that you never expect. So far, uh, things have gone really remarkably well. As I say, the host communities have been incredibly generous uh, to accepting uh, the refugees and making a home for them. The question is how long that will be sustained. There are indications of increasing tensions in some of the local communities over the things that I've described, schools and, and, and uh, infrastructure, which may, may become worse uh, over summer. Certainly it takes a psychological toll, particularly on, on, on people who have been displaced from their homes, and those issues then, then get worked out in, in unfortunate ways. Abuna Paolo, inside the country, how are people coping day to day? How do you feed your family in the context of this fierce battle? The humanitarian disaster is already there, is huge. But nevertheless, uh, our youth, if they would be here, they will say priority to the right of self-determination of the people, priority to our right to democracy, priority to human rights in Syria. The humanitarian emergency, huge, awful, cannot hide the decision of the people of Syria to change. And it's often used just to say, stop the fight, please. The people of Syria say, no way back. In those days, the Syrian civil war is now a civil regional war because of the lack of responsibilities of stakeholders, both on regional and global level. The humanitarian situation is not because of a tornado, is not because of an earthquake, is because of political enormous responsibility on regional and global level. Sarah Lee, you have documented abuses on both sides of the battle lines. What are you seeing in this descent to brutality? Um, well, on the side of the Syrian government, uh, we have seen uh, uh, an incredible level of indiscriminate and, uh, in some cases, deliberate bombardment of civilian areas. Uh, uh, in some cases, uh, in terms of aerial bombardment, which in fact has uh, been responsible for less than 4% of the civilian deaths. Uh, the vast majority of deaths from indiscriminate attacks are from the artillery strikes um, that the government has launched uh, indiscriminately. So where the government might think there's fighting, where the government might think uh, is a rebel-held area, um, they will generally let loose all of their firepower, uh, including uh, quite wide-scale use of cluster munitions in civilian areas, which of course uh, have long-term effects, long-lasting effects. Um, we also have had thousands and thousands of people uh, arbitrarily arrested and detained. Uh, just a few weeks ago in Raqqa, our team uh, uh, came upon some torture devices in one of the government intelligence security centers, uh, torture devices that uh, uh, Syrian uh, victims had been describing to us uh, for such a long time, uh, but we were actually able to gather uh, these machines uh, used to stretch people uh, to death or, or to torture them, uh, typically to make false confessions. Um, on, on the uh, rebel side, we've also documented very serious abuses, uh, particularly uh, deaths of soldiers in captivity, uh, deaths in custody, uh, uh, torture uh, and abuses, and of course uh, recently the uh, now infamous video that we documented of the mutilation of a corpse uh, resulting in the cannibalism by uh, a rebel soldier. Um, and, you know, it's, I think, important uh, in any conflict to, to highlight and to know where the vast majority of, of the criminal acts, of the acts that violate international humanitarian law are coming from, and they are overwhelmingly at the hands of the government. The government has the vast majority of the firepower, and the government has chosen uh, to use that firepower in a reckless, indiscriminate way, and in some cases, particularly in the cases of uh, 12 bakeries that the government uh, targeted over uh, a course of 48 hours, uh, 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 attacking, uh, using uh, artillery and, and airstrikes to bombard people waiting in line for bread. Um, one point I want to also emphasize, uh, because it's gotten so much media attention, uh, and I think is just a, a note of caution in terms of how important it is to actually get the facts and the evidence of what's happening on the ground, uh, are the uh, allegations of wide-scale rape uh, in Syria. Um, this is not something that we have been able to verify or document, um, uh, just as we were not able to verify or document it in Libya. Um, and I just want to uh, express a word of caution in terms of relying on information that has not actually been verified by witnesses. Wherever the violence began, and however asymmetrical it may or may not be, this sense of abuse is now on both sides of the fight. 
has made it so hard for so many Syrians to wrap their head around what's really going on. What is the fallout of that, of seeing both sides commit arguably or potentially crimes against humanity? Well, uh, from our discussions with people in rebel-held areas, particularly in Aleppo, um, what we see is that it's not just about the you know, uh, violations of human rights or, or the outright abuses of torture and, and, and killings by the rebels that is scaring people off. Um, but rather, it's the nature of some of the rebel groups as extremists, as extremely uh, as extreme Islamists, and the uh, the future that they're promising uh, for Syrians, particularly in Aleppo, that I think has uh, uh, lost uh, a lot of support. Um, and you know, as as probably in any situation, the worst face, uh, how, no matter how small a percentage of the fighting it may be, becomes the dominant one. And so, uh, for many Syrians, they. Uh, have reluctantly made a choice uh, uh, that they would rather have the devil they know than you know the, these uh, more fanatical Islamists who they feel are are are, are not are foreigners to to their struggle. Salman, I know you've looked at this quite a bit. The, the mix of fighting forces on the ground in Syria. How big a role do extremist groups play? How much of a threat are they to Syria's future, or is it somehow, as times you've argued, somewhat overplayed in the media? Well, it's, first of all, it's, it's good to be with you and good to be with, uh, with the other panelists. Um, yes, there's a lot played about the extremist groups. I, I think Jabhat al-Nusra, for example, is probably no more than about two to 3,000 people. Um, hardcore, most of them uh, are either foreign or come from Iraq in that core group. Um, of course, the regime has had a hand in this regard. The tribal figures who were on that border with Iraq were telling us a year and a half ago these people are coming back. We saw them go one way, they're coming back. Maliki's turning a blind eye. And so the regime has helped to create, in my view, a self-fulfilling prophecy. Now, of course, it's got much worse than that. And the ranks of more extremist groups are being swelled by Syrians. Poor Syrians, desperate Syrians, particularly in areas in the north and the east um, of the country. And uh, I have... Uh, I have very little doubt that many of those people would choose another way if they could find a way to protect themselves, to, to bring about their livelihood, to get the kind of relief that they need. Um, but that kind of organization has been lacking on what is called the so-called uh, moderate side. But you know, when we talk about extremism and we talk about foreign fighters, we cannot, we cannot get away from the fact that there are probably 5,000 Hezbollah fighters right now who have come across from Lebanon. There are probably 5,000 more, I've been told, being prepared to come to fight in places like Dara and in Aleppo. We can't get away from the fact that there are probably 1,500 to 2,000 IGRC-backed fighters, trained fighters uh, that have come from Iraq, Sadrists, and others. So this, as is being said, is becoming a much more of a regional conflict. In fact, what we are seeing, if we're talking about the extremes, is a fight between Hezbollah, Iran, and its backers, and in Syria, uh, where Al-Qaeda meets. And this is, this is now, I'm afraid, a situation which can take not just uh, Syria um, into uh, uh, in, an abyss, but also the entire region. The region is on a knife edge, and we wake up this morning and find that there are now rockets uh, uh, g going into parts of uh, Beirut, um, and across again into, into the Hermel area. And it is this, this fight between extremes which we've got to get away from. We've got to find a way to reclaim uh, both the, the project to save Syria as well as uh, the entire region. Salman, it's quite sobering because you and I have been talking for two years and you keep describing how the situation will descend without any sort of coordinated diplomatic action. And you were right along the way, and unfortunately we've seen the worst case scenario in your mind play out. But now going into this somewhat hopeful, if cautiously optimistic, push for a new round of diplomatic talks, the Geneva II talks are they're being called, can you give us a snapshot of what kind of diplomatic momentum might be there? Yes. Um, you know, uh, just on the first point, I have been saying for a year and a half now, if we're not careful, if we allow the Syrian situation to drift, Containment is not an option. It has to be towards the resolution. If we're not careful, Syria can act as a catalyst for a zone of conflict from the eastern Mediterranean shore to the Gulf waters. And that is precisely 
what is happening. And I say this and knowing that it's going to be very hard to stop it now. Who can stop it? If, if we see three concurrent civil wars in Syria, Lebanon, and Iraq, um, for example. With regards to the diplomatic push, I know there's a lot being discussed with regarding to Geneva. I actually want to quote to you something that I was told last night by a friend, acquaintance, colleague in Damascus, who, frankly, is pretty close to uh, elements of the regime, not because he's a supporter, but just because he happens to be there and knows these people. And he said to me, look, if anyone thinks that this regime is taking Geneva seriously, they're beeping crazy. <laughs> they're not. They're not taking Geneva seriously. The delegation that they send, if they do send one, will be something so weak uh, that it shouldn't be taken, in, in, being able to have any empowered uh, uh, way of, of negotiating. Secondly, the regime is insisting that Assad stays, that there will be elections next year, and what I'm being told is that the outcome of those elections are probably already decided. 70 to 75 percent will vote for Bashar al-Assad. It's already been calculated that six to seven million people will not be able to vote. They're either displaced or across the borders. And the ones who will be most likely be able to vote are the ones in the cities. And yes, there is a large gray area here of Syrians who have not gone either way. And certainly in that environment, we're not going to see them uh, uh, sticking their heads up and voting to get rid of Bashar. Alex, you're hearing this, and I'm sure it's very sobering for you. This is going to be a driver of a humanitarian catastrophe. You're trying, you're struggling now to stem. You've had to, you've talked of, the UN has talked of borrowing from other budgets to help Syrians. Well, why the shortfall? Why has it been so hard to rally help to this cause? Well, first let me say that we're aware of these numbers and these predictions, which is why in, in a few weeks we'll be releasing what will be called the Regional Relief Plan 5. It's our fifth iteration of that. Uh, it'll be in the several billion of dollars uh, that we'll be identifying as needs for the rest uh, of the year. Um, we have raised substantial amounts of money so far. There's more to be done. Uh, I think an international commitment makes those numbers actually realistic. I think we could get to that point if there's a, a commitment from governments uh, and also from, now that I'm speaking at the World Economic Forum here, uh, from the private sector, which has been largely absent so far in the, uh, in the fundraising, but there are tremendous resources represented in this room and in this conference um, that if pooled together, it could make a really huge difference on the humanitarian uh, side. Short of that, what we need to do is we prioritize our work, and obviously we prioritize it towards emergency care uh, and life-saving activity, but there are many other needs, whether it's education or, as I mentioned, psychosocial work or others, livelihoods work, community building so the communities don't fall apart with the influx uh, that needs to be done. Uh, but ultimately, the answer here has got to start with uh, a commitment by the international community to, to, to end the violence uh, one way or another. But if I could just take one more second, I'm going a little further than your question. Even if the violence were to stop uh, today or soon, um, the impact, the consequences of it will be felt for years. There's no reason to think that people will begin to immediately return to Syria, given whatever divisions remain there, but also the destruction of homes and communities and livelihoods. Uh, and I think we're, we're facing a situation of massive displacement for years to come in the region that has to be factored into uh, the long-term uh, consequences here. Just to, we are still wrapping up the Balkan displacement from the 1990s. So these processes last a long time and will be with us for a long time and will need to be dealt with and supported for a long time. But that means also opportunities for investment, if I can use that word here, uh, for uh, solving these problems at the local level. Sarah Lee, when you look to the long run, how do you foresee a Syria that can pull itself back together again on a social level, on a political level, when there have been so many abuses and so much distrust on every side? Um, well, one would have to take a very, very long-term view, and, and one need only look at Iraq and the situation in Iraq, 10 years after a, a full-scale military intervention, 10 years after a brutal civil war, uh, after a very, very short window of relative peace, the country is on the brink of civil war again, uh, with the number of, uh, of deaths and killings uh, in the past month uh, rising to the levels of the height of the civil war. Um, there are no easy answers to this, 
And since I don't realistically see the international community uh, taking a long-term view, for example, a long-term peacekeeping force presence uh, throughout Syria, uh, I think that we have to anticipate that the conflict in Syria will last uh, quite a long time, um, regardless of what any immediate victory outcomes look like. Abuna Paolo, I know many people refer to you as the revolutions priest. We know where you stand very passionately. Uh, but when you look at Syrian society as you've come to know it, how do you see sides coming together again? Is there a middle that can create some understanding? I was north of Aleppo with a man called Jihad Razal. He had lost his brother in the battle, and he has lost his arm in the battle. And we were working in an initiative to propose reconciliation to his Shiite neighbors and even to ask the Kurds that are in the area to be the moderator of the reconciliation. He lost his second brother in that day, and the second day he was in front of the television say, this is our hand, come to reconciliation. Those are real Syrians. We need a real court of international justice, because even Carla Del Ponte, she is using the fact that uh, perhaps the chemicals have been used by the revolution. The responsibility of these things fall on the regime and those who are protecting the regime. We need an international court that will uh, make stopping and uh, f finish with these crimes of the regime and the other side. We are not interested in having crimes on the side of the revolution. The revolution is infiltrated by extreme groups that have been created by the regime and sent to fight in Iraq and in Lebanon. We know them. Everybody knows. They don't like to see. Uh, we, we, uh, we need to work, and Ramadan is close to coming. Ramadan next month in July. We have to pray this year, all of us, Jews, Christians, and Muslims, that we are the family of Abraham for the reconciliation between Sunni and Shiite. Everybody should make iftars and offer possibilities of meeting at home and everywhere for Muslims, Sunnis, and Shiite to reconcile. Everybody has responsibilities in this civil Muslim world, Muslim war. Everybody has a responsibility in this reconciliation that is so needed. And then we're speaking with people that are hard workers, people of uh, strong will and work, please create, create a free Syria chamber of commerce. Create new possibilities. The youth that are not dead are handicapped and discouraged because of the situation. Let's create new hope for Syria or Syria will be dangerous for all. Salman, any new ideas you want to pipe in there on how to bring people together and make it? Well, first of all, I will take Father Paolo's advice and have an iftar where I bring my Sunni and Shia friends and others, Christians, my Catholic wife, all together. I think that's a, it's a very good idea and, and shouldn't be underestimated. I've always passionately believed, um, listening to Syrians, that a political solution at this stage does not lie between a regime opposition dialogue. Simply the regime is not going to negotiate in good faith. But where it does lie is very hard work, but where it does lie is giving Syrians the opportunity from all backgrounds, from the major constituencies, the economic elites, the independent sheikhs and, and priests and others, the tribal leaders, as well as Alawis, Shias, Sunnis, Kurds, Druze, and others to come together to find a space for a very serious discussion on where their interests lie uh, with regards to the future of their country and how they can rebuild it. It's an, essentially a negotiation which needs to take place between them and to arrive at an, a new equation for sharing power. I believe it's possible. You know why? Because you just hear Syrians. Syrians are Syrians first, even to this day, even despite the effort of, of, of certain parties, especially the regime, to tear the social fabric of Syria apart. And so. This, is, this has to be done seriously. This has to be a serious process of dialogue. I believe the international community has not paid enough attention to this. 
uh, on the margins. We have been running certain dialogues. Others have in this respect. This requires a lot more international and regional support than it has. And I'm afraid to say that even the official opposition has not, this official Syrian opposition has not yet provided a venue for that kind of dialogue. Until we get there, I'm afraid we're going to continue to see that political solution being elusive. A broad-based track to civil discourse that you're proposing. That, that's right. And, I, and uh, even to make it track one and a half, I believe that the United Nations should have been doing this from day one. The United Nations has legitimacy. It's probably the only thing. It has. It doesn't have money. It doesn't have arms. It does, but it has legitimacy. And if it could provide a space and a venue for Syrians to, to come and to talk and, 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 the, and the rest. And, I, and in that respect, I don't believe that uh, the special envoy has been doing enough, frankly. When you look at the Syrian opposition, the Syrian National Council based abroad, how much legitimacy, how much leverage do you think they have on the ground? Could they even practically negotiate a ceasefire? Well, I think we have to be honest here that the main legitimacy of the Syrian opposition coalition, which is, as you know, is still discussing its expansion and its leadership and everything else today, um, Istanbul, its main credibility and its legitimacy comes from the international community and its foreign backers. What is lacking is the support inside the country. And what is lacking is a real presence inside the country. And that is a big gap. Now, they are attempting to, to do that. But I'm afraid they seem to be in a perpetual state of reorganizing themselves. And that's not good enough. Um, again, they are trying again. We hope that they can bring the right leadership. We hope that they can organize. And there's some good people who are working very hard in, in Southeast Turkey and other places looking at how to develop a relief and aid and all the rest of it inside the country. But the simple fact is they don't have enough of a presence inside the country. They don't have enough credibility as a result. Let's open up to questions. Anyone from the floor who'd like to pipe in with an intervention? Gentleman up front. Yes. Man, I, I have a question for you. Um, Could you introduce, your, introduce yourself? Yeah, my name is Kareem Suwaid. I'm from Lebanon. I'd like to ask Salman a question about this on everybody's mind. Why is the US not intervening in Syria? We saw it being paralyzed in Tunis fumbling in Egypt, leading from the back in, in uh, Libya, but really not doing much uh, in, uh, in Syria. And at the same time, we hear the Secretary of State coming to this uh, spe specific forum and talking about the Israeli-Arab conflict and launching new initiatives. How can they really pretend to resolve a 50-year-old conflict when they cannot even stop a bloodshed next door? Thank you. Well, it starts with the leadership. It starts with Barack Obama. Barack Obama has been extremely reluctant. He doesn't want to, uh, he, to, to get involved in the complexity of the Syrian crisis. There are many in the leadership who don't want to own Syria. Um, so what they've been trying to do is to work in a multilateral fashion. They've been trying to work with the regional players. But you're right. They have not shown the vision and leadership um, that is probably required in order to uh, to chart a course um, which is sustainable over a period of time. There's another word, Iraq. The legacy of Iraq is burned deeply into the soul and the hearts of many of the American decision makers. Many of them have been to Iraq, the, whether military or on the civilian side. And the mistake that was made there, the illegal war that was Iraq, is a legacy that we are living with today. That doesn't mean that, uh, uh, you know, a terrible dictator like Saddam Hussein should not have been got rid of, but I'm afraid what the, the outcome of what has happened in Iraq, and 10 years on, I'm afraid we still have, in my view, a broken political system, which still requires a third-party broker, is a terrible, in my view, uh, legacy um, of, of that particular uh, conflict. And then, of course, it is trying to find the right path, the right course. Um, we've had two tracks, and those two tracks continue. There is the effort to find a political solution, and then that's the political track. Then there is what is described as assistance or the military side uh, to the, the opposition, uh, uh, both 
in, in the exile as well as um, on the ground. And, and I have to say, I've noticed that there is a developing consensus now, despite all the efforts regarding Geneva, and I believe Secretary Kerry is trying desperately hard to work with uh, uh, Foreign Minister Lavrov and the Russians and others to, to forge something. But I believe as we are talking peace, people are actually preparing for more war. And it's that particular track that is probably going to strengthen. And I see a developing consensus. And as you heard yesterday for Senator McCain, but even more importantly from Senator Menendez, the chair of the uh, Foreign Relations Committee, there is a consensus that you have to change the military balance in order to arrive at a political solution. And I, I tag that with a greater level of comfort that Western powers, the United States and Europe in particular, are showing towards Salim Idris and his commanders. And I think it's almost dictated by the situation on the ground that we will see that track um, emerge in the, in the front in the not too distant future. Sara Lee, is there something other than intervention that the U.S. should be doing? Are there steps along the way that are being missed? Um, absolutely, and um, it's almost a little frustrating that there's uh, almost complete focus in the media on the issue of military intervention, should we or shouldn't we? Have we not learned the lessons of the illegal Iraq war, or should we repeat them, uh, and so forth? And, you know, so much uh, drama and, and, and focus on, oh, the poor Syrians, what can we do to help them? Uh, and yet... There's virtually nothing being done, actually, uh, to help the Syrian civilians who are bearing the brunt of this war. Um, so, for example, I'm sure we can hear from, from the UNHCR just how much of the commitments uh, to funding for Syrian refugees uh, have been met. The international community that is so willing uh, to send arms uh, to Syria, uh, are they willing to take care, at least in the short term, of the refugees in Syria? Uh, the answer is sadly not. Uh, how much uh, and is there enough funding for cross-border aid to reach Syrians who are uh, in rebel-held areas who are not getting uh, much of the aid that the UN is able to distribute? Uh, sadly not. What efforts are being made uh, to seek prosecution of Syrian government officials, uh, for example, for pushing a resolution that would refer the situation in Syria to the International Criminal Court? Uh, that's not happening at the General Assembly either. Um, so, you know, let's show some real credibility and some real concern for the Syrian civilians um, before at least or at the parallel track uh, of talking uh, about what we can do to further arm uh, uh, to the region. Sorry, I just want to interject. I completely agree. I would take it even further, though, the failure of the international community, the failure of the Assad regime, first and foremost, to protect civilians. Is a, is, a, is a legacy I think we're going to live with for a very long time. The, the, this kind of killing of civilians. I was working for Kofi Annan in 2005 um, at the UN, where we had this big summit focused on the responsibility to protect, focused on the responsibility that lies with governments, with states, not usurping sovereignty, but holding out a further action if that is violated. And I'm afraid... We've allowed this situation to go on for two and a half years, and here there's plenty of blame to go around, of course. It, but the simple fact is we've not been able to protect civilians, and most likely many more are going to die in the, in the months and possibly even years ahead. Alex, last I had checked, the ple of the pledges made in Kuwait for Syrian refugee aid, only 50% had been received. Is that gone up, or is there still a shortfall? I think for our overall funding, we're at the 60 to 70% range overall for the last appeal that we had. But with the new appeal that's coming, obviously that number will go down, will go what, down considerably. That's what you've raised, but of what was pledged, has everything been delivered? Not everything has been delivered. A, a lot has been delivered. I, I, uh, you know, there is much more that need that we need, but I, I do want to uh, recognize the, the large amount of money that has come in to help us do the work that we need to do. Uh, but there, there will be much, much more that's needed. Yeah. Questions? Gentleman in the back. Abdullah al Qadak Sahafi. I would want to ask if the Canal Mujtama at Dauli. The community did not support up till now, clearly, the Syrian refugees residing in Lebanon, Turkey, and Jordan. How can we expect that the international community would support reconstruction of Syria, particularly that the cost in Syria 
for the destruction that happened amounted to over 200 billion USDs. Shouldn't we, shouldn't the international community consider that uh, Gaza that has been destructed also has not received any money with the exception of uh, Doha's assistance and the UAE's assistance. The other question I want to ask, if uh, Al Qusir has uh, gone to the hands of uh, uh, gone from the hands of the Syrian regime, isn't the pay card the, la the card now uh, in the hands of uh, the regime for the upcoming? Let's um, capture a few more questions round. before we launch into that. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, Yusuf al Khoui, isn't the real problem that the state in the Middle East has really failed to look after the interests of his people? And this is quite a deep internal problem that we don't find accommodation between different groups where minorities in both Syria and Iraq come and be in power under a different name, Arab nationalism, what have you. And the aspiration of the people are suppressed for a long time. It is really not, in my view, Shia Sunni problem as per se. It is the monopolization of political actors, of the fault lines within societies to manipulate it to their political advantage. As Mr. Sheikh said, the supposedly Shia regime in Syria used these extremists to kill Shias in Iraq. So that is a proof that it is not so much to do with Shia Sunni. It is more to do with the political manipulation. That cheap, respected Sunni Imam, Sheikh Bouti, was blown off in his mosque by the Sunni rebels. And this was glorified. No, 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 no. Sorry. We'll, we'll hold on. Yeah, it's okay. No, it's okay. He wasn't blown off. You saw please, the video of his death? Please continue. Sorry? Did you see the video of his death? Abuna okay, Paolo, let me finish. Okay, let's say we don't know who blew it. But the fact is, his killing was glorified on Al Jazeera and other Arab Gulf TVs. And that glorification, whoever did the job, is actually helped to raise tensions and sectarian conflicts in the region. The point I'm trying to make is that the political actors, the regional, and uh, to a lesser extent, the global political actors, they are using the fault lines in Muslim societies to actually manipulate their political purposes. And in effect, it really has nothing to do with religious or sectarian complex per se. Thank, Thank you very you much. Thank you for the comment. Akiva El Dal Monitor. Um, what is the role that Israel should or should not play, if, if at all, since... Uh, Israel is a close neighbor of Syria. Israel has been involved, whether uh, we like it or not, we Israelis. Um, and uh, it seems that uh, there is still a debate going on in Israel whether we should support the, uh, as you described, the devil we know, or take the risk of supporting the devil we don't, whether he's a devil or an angel, I'm not sure. But uh, if you were an Israeli, what would you, any of you, advise us to do or not to do? I wish to answer to Let's that. start with that one, and we'll work our way down, starting with Salman. Okay. Um, it's good to see you here, Akiva. Um, well, first of all, Israel will, should do its best to stay out of it, um, if it can. Now, uh, some would say that there is an effort being made to actually draw Israel into this. Um, we know that Israel has set its red lines, and it seems to be acting on them. From what I understand, there's the transfer of advanced weapons to Hezbollah. In many ways, we're seeing the conflict between the Israelis and Hezbollah and the Iranians shift into Syria. The second red line is with regards to what goes in the Golan, and we're now seeing regular, almost exchanges of fire after so many decades of quiet. And the third... Um, areas with regards to chemical weapons and of course Israel was one of those that raised the alarm uh, with regards uh, to, their, to their use. 
So it should try to stay out of it, but it should also give up on the old paradigm of better the devil you know. Um, because, and this goes more broadly for, I think, for Israel's posture. Um, Israel's posture is likely we're surrounded by all these threats. Let's circle the wagons. Um, fine, I would say with one exception, that is you should move towards a just solution to the Palestinian issue. That's probably the best contribution that Israel can make in terms of the realizing the two-state solution. Um, but it's also important, I think, that we hear from Israeli leaders speaking um, much more openly about how um, people in Arab societies are getting rid of their dictatorships, how they are getting to realize their rights. Um, we know the fear and foreboding that Israel leadership and even society has, but this has to be recognized. Maybe nothing else, but this has to be recognized from, um, from an Israeli perspective as well. I think Shimon Peres, who I believe is here later today, has actually spoken like that, but we've never heard anything like that from uh, Prime Minister Netanyahu. All we've heard about are, is, of course, the rising fear of, of Islamist extremism. Um, my fear is that Israel will be increasingly drawn in. Um, the transfer, the continued transfer of weapons uh, to uh, Syria by the Russians will likely elicit a response. I think that's a, a very dangerous situation. And it will also probably be drawn in because, as was mentioned earlier, the UN peacekeeping regime, which has survived for so many decades, is going to come under increasing strain, particularly um, uh, UNDOF, whose mandate is up for renewal at the end of June, and also um, UNIFIL. In that regard, I note that uh, the Lebanese army is thinning in the south, and the amount of harassment of UNIFIL itself is increasing um, in that local area. So these are, these are all dangerous situations, but um, as I said, um, Israel should try to stay out of it as best it can. Sarah any thoughts? Uh, I guess two things. One, to strongly agree that Israel should stay out, and bombing Syria is just about the best thing that uh, Israel can do for President Assad right now. Uh, and more importantly, given that Israel has zero legitimacy in the region, uh, to be a legitimate commentator even uh, on the region, it would need to first withdraw its settlements uh, and uh, end its occupation, because otherwise it's, it's you know, nothing but an extra source of conflict and, and new uh, uh, instability in the region. Um, on the point that was made about governments uh, uh, deliberately taking advantage of Sunni Shia splits and so forth, you know, the, the situation that we see now in Syria, the catastrophe, the inability of the opposition to become a cohesive opposition that reflects the aspirations of the Syrian people, that's not an accident. That's a direct byproduct of Syrian government policy to keep civil society a weak uh, to keep uh, independent institutions illegal. And it's not a unique uh, uh, approach either. This is the operating uh, uh, the toolbox of many, many governments in the region. So we can look at the cracked vase of Syria now on the floor and sit here and bemoan what should we do about it. But I would urge you also to consider what can we do now to prevent new Syrias throughout the Middle East? Uh, and how can we build societies where there is resilient independent civil society with free expression? Um, where independent civil societies can exist and are not banned and you don't go to jail for uh, participating in a demonstration or insulting the king or the president uh, or uh, uh, forming a political opposition group. Um, if we don't want to see future broken bases in the Middle East, let's also think about what we need to fix uh, in the governments that have not yet collapsed uh, because they are rigged uh, to ensure um, that transitions are not possible. Um, that formations of opposition, that, that the cohesiveness of civil society is not possible. Father Paolo on the question of Israel. Thank you, Lara. First of all, the, <coughs> sir, they recall us that there is in this moment a town with people like you and your family attacked uh, on a radical desire to eradicate these people. They are on their own fields, they are in their own homes, and their right to stay there is negated. The people of Kusair are asking you to take care. Israel, Israel is not out. Who says that Israel is out? It's fully in the game. There is a showing of teeth with the nuclear issue of Iran, 
And there is, everybody knows, a negotiation under the table going on with Iran and the United States. And Syria is organically part of the game. What can be offered to Iran in Syria in order to have something from Iran on the negotiation of uh, nuclear issues? And so far. So uh, from, the, from the point of view of the Syrian revolution, Israel is helping and backing the repression of Bashar al-Assad regime because it's not assuming the responsibility to help a people, a neighbor, there is in our having laws, uh, duties related to the rights of your neighbor to be assisted and we are not assisted. Uh, even the chemical issue is not a red line anymore. It is a pinky line or something. It is nothing coherent. Uh, the future of Israel is expressed by the goodwill of democratic Israelis, caring for the good of all the people in this region that is to all of us. Uh, divide et impera is not a good politic. To divide your enemies in order to uh, have an interest on the geostrategical level is a moral mistake and in the long term is a geostrategical mistake. Alex, I know geopolitics isn't your wheelhouse in particular, but from a humanitarian standpoint, is there a kind of assistance or a constructive role Israel could or should be playing? I really think I'll, I'll stay out of that one if you don't mind. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Any other questions from the floor? From the back? Let's say something about Kusei that cannot be assisted. Why, why, why the, the Red Cross cannot come in? Why your institutions cannot help the Syrians on the ground? In the end, the humanitarian structures are used by the regime. Thank you, Paolo, for your input. I can't speak English, but I want to ask my question in Arabic language because I'm working with the Arabic department in Anadolu Turkish Agency. Uh, my question goes to Mr. Alex. We have interviewed the Prime Minister of Jordan, and he said that the Security Council has refused or uh, has, during its first session actually, refused to send a mission to Jordan or to any other country where there are many refugees from Syria. What is the role played by the High Commission for Refugees in this case? And another question to Mr. al Sheikh when it comes to Arab Spring countries. I have heard many colleagues ask why doesn't the USA intervene militarily in Syria? Don't you think that the Arab revolutions maybe have failed in the Arab world and that many countries are blaming the USA for this failure? This machine wasn't working, so I didn't really hear the question. If you could repeat the question that was asked of me, it would be good. Would you like to repeat that? <laughs> <laughs> well, uh, misquote him. Salman, do you want this to was not working, part? so. Yeah. Um, m my part in terms of why doesn't the US intervene militarily, is, I think is what I heard. Um, well, again, you have a, you have a president who doesn't want to do things without an international mandate um, and, 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 and to, in effect, not have the, uh, to break international law. It is a bit odd, though, that international law and crimes against humanity and war crimes are being committed every day, and yet the international community is still not being able to, to respond. With regards to the specific question, though, um, I think there is uh, an increasing case that is being made for surgical strikes that would, we know the number of sites where, um, for example, the probably 300 plus Scud missiles are now being fired um, towards their own Syrian populations. We also know where the airfields are. Um, so there are those, and you heard it very strongly from Senator McCain yesterday, um, uh, that th that is the direction that the United States needs to go into. Um, it's not yet the majority view um, in the U.S., but I suspect it would gain ground um, the longer this, um, the, this goes on. As I said, I think uh, the political track uh, 
uh, may well continue, but it will be the, the military options which will come into play. I'm always a little bit hesitant, having watched and having described the Iraq war as illegal, uh, to, to advocate uh, that kind of uh, military intervention, also because it can lead to many more complications. But as in the case of Bosnia, it took four years, it took 200,000 people killed, it was starting to destabilize a wider region. You saw uh, that a group of countries led by the United States did militarily intervene. And I suspect if we continue to see the trajectory of this conflict, the only difference, of course, is that there, this is a much bigger regional conflict now. And so in that respect, you're going to see the United States uh, still uh, probably be hesitant. But it all depends on, on, on what happens with things like chemical weapons or Islamist uh, extremists. Um, and, and, and can I say the red line with, regarding chemical weapons it's not by, it's clear, it's not their use by the regime, it's them falling into somebody else's hands. And when we talk about weapons falling into the wrong people's hands, I have to ask the question, who said that the regime having all of these weapons is in the right hands? I mean, <laughs> from the start. I, I find it an extraordinary debate. And can I just say one thing on the humanitarian? Uh, I, I think new terms, um, a new consensus has to be forged for humanitarian action in Syria. You know, UN General Assembly Resolution 146, passed in 82, which upholds state sovereignty, is not working here in the case of Syria. So there's this endless debate about cross-border operations and cross-line. This does require the key uh, Security Council countries first and foremost, but also the other BRIC countries, the non-aligned movement, the, the Chinese, the Indians, the South Africans, and others, for God's sake, coming together, because these people are suffering in an absolutely horrendous way. Alex, I'd love to hear, before you go into cross-border, I'd like to hear your thoughts on this seemingly widespread sentiment that the UN is somehow, is aid is somehow co-opted by the regime or that somehow assists in the patronage networks of the regime. This seems to be a widely held fear or concern in the region. How do you respond to it? Well, uh, it, the, the fact is that most of the aid we are able to deliver inside Syria goes in government control there. There's no question about that. Those, those are the facts. It doesn't mean it's going to necessarily to regime supporters. It's going to people in areas that we can have access to. So there's, we can't make that easy assumption. Would we like to be able to get to opposition areas? Absolutely we would, and there are two ways to do it. You can either go through Syria, through what we call cross-line operations, which we have done now more than a dozen times, at great risk, because the people who are running these convoys, the UN uh, teams and the NGOs who are involved in doing this are crossing battle lines. They're being shot at. They're endangered by both sides as they undertake these activities. And we'd like to be able to do cross-border operations from Turkey, from Jordan, from other places to reach the opposition areas. Currently, we are not able to do that under uh, the UN rules because we don't have the permission of the Syrian government to uh, enter uh, into their sovereign uh, space. That could be overturned by the Security Council. If there were a vote from the Security Council, the Emergency Relief Coordinator, that Valerie Amos has asked for a vote from the Security Council to permit us to do that. It hasn't been forthcoming. It could be granted by the Syrian government, could permit this. We want the access the Father is talking about here. We want to get to every single person we can reach, and we have people on the ground uh, who are undertaking life-threatening uh, operations inside Syria to get to as many people as we can possibly reach. Close us out today, Salman. Could you respond to one of those floating fears in the region that somehow Syria is going to disintegrate into statelets, an Alawite statelet, a Kurdish statelet? It's one of those things one could never imagine, but starts being talked about and somehow conceivable. Do you think that could ever happen in Syria? Well, de facto it could, though of course I think many Alawis, um, given the chance, would not want to hold themselves up in uh, what is really an unviable state. It was tried in the 1920s. It didn't really work. It, can it really sustain itself, especially given the security fears that it faces? And yes, with regards to the Kurdish uh, situation already in northern Iraq, we have a de facto situation where big oil uh, and regional players are leading to perhaps a, a changing of the map with regards to Iraq itself. But the point I want to make is it's not just a patchwork of de facto statelets in Syria, this can go all the way again from the Mediterranean to the Gulf. A series of, of de facto zones and statelets 
which take into account the north of Lebanon or the south of Lebanon, uh, which take into account uh, a, a Kurdish uh, entity, even something in the south with regards to others and uh, with regards to Iraq. Uh, in my view, that's not a very stable state of affairs. In my view, the catalyst for this is Syria. In my view, the person and the regime that is most responsible for this is the Assad regime. And the quicker we can find a way of moving on and finding a transition that works in Syria, the better. Salman, Sara Lee, Father Paolo, and Alex, thank you so much for your time and insight. Thank Please you. join me in a round of applause for our panelists. Thank you for you.